Welcome to Design Thinking Games, a fantasy and user experience podcast. Each episode, your podcast hosts, Tim Broadwater and Michael Schofield, will examine the player experience of board games, pen and paper role playing games, live action games, mobile games, and video games. You can find every episode, including this one, on your podcatcher of choice and on the web at designthinkinggames.com. So last time, um, you asked me a lot about um, the games that I gravitate to and like. Specifically, the question was... um, identity in game and how do I see myself in games and we kind of went down a whole conversation about what I like in games um, uh, which was kind of to be able to be creative and customize and work within parameters you know Um, but then kind of flipping that um, I kind of want to ask you the same question and so what is it the type of games that you like and how do you see yourself in games and um, and what are the common, I guess, what's the commonalities between those games? I'm very drawn to, I don't know what you would call them. Choose your own adventure, click your own adventure. The games I'm thinking of literally off the top of my head at the moment are these, are Don't Nod's Life is Strange series, Telltale's series before Telltale went under. The, yeah, even before that, these old, you know, adventurous Sherlock Holmes series where the the game is largely in choosing the questions that you ask or how you answer how you how you react to situations more than navigating through dark hallways and popping the first thing on sight i enjoy those games too but when i think about the th- something that I'm in the mood for more often than not, almost all the time. It's one of these experiences on railroad, <laughs> you know, um, where, where, yeah. I So you, you were talking last time about RPGs and the ability to, and the idea of the sandbox world. And I don't very much appreciate a sandbox, even when it's good. I really? yeah, Red Dead Redemption comes to mind here, where it's arguably one of the best sandboxes for an individual for a single player to have ever been made. And even though you're constrained to the narrative of Arthur Morgan, you know, you can wander off and live in the woods <laughs> for the entirety of the game and never en- <laughs> and never engage with a plot point. And I find, I f- as fun as that can be, as fun as it is to be a rum runner and to shoot bears and to grow a beard, I find that lack of, I find that continuity error where, oh no, you have something to do immediately or the town is going to burn and then you wander off for 40 days. <laughs> I find that yeah. so disruptive that I that I kind of get repulsed by it. So I have my fun in those games and then I walk away. What I like is a mass effect, right? You have a number of choices that you can make. But all t- 100% transparency. I've yeah. I've never played Mass Effect, so I don't know anything about it. This is one that I've totally encouraged you in the past off mic to try. The idea is that my Mass Effect is a science fiction game and to really simplify it the you know it's it's a it's a little bit of a space opera kind of 80s um and you are the one person in the universe who can assemble the ragtag team fight the big bad maybe save the galaxy etc you but instead of like other other games i'm thinking like maybe being the fallout guy in, in the fallout games or um or whatever you aren't you you aren't tim in the year 2142 you're commander shepherd you have a name and not only do you have a name you have a voice and you can pick male or female 
but they have different voice actors. So you are piloting Commander Shepard. You are not Commander Shepard. And there's a lot of wiggle room about how your Shepard responds to the situation. And they do something really cool where the decisions that you make in game one roll over to the decisions in game two, which roll over into game three, and even vaguely impact the spin-off, Mass Effect Andromeda. And I and oh, when nice. Mass Effect 4 comes out, I assume it's going to take your saved files there. But So is it a first It's, it's a railroad. No, it's a third person. Uh, you are a third person shepherd looking over the shoulders of your hero. Uh, and your hero is it's an RPG, so they're either the equivalent of a magic user or a fighter, uh, just space versions. Um, but that's those are the things I gravitate toward. I I don't want to be me in the space <laughs> in the space opera. I want to be I want to be Commander Shepard. And specifically, I have a very specific Commander Shepard who is defined by my decisions, but it's my Shepard but it's still Shepard. It's not me. And those are the things I like. So Life is Strange has, the first one has Max Caulfield. You aren't Max Caulfield. You're piloting Max Caulfield. Um, those kind of things. So is it safe to kind of, I, I guess to describe it, you would say that this is really, it's the narrative. Like going into a story and then your actions in that character when you're not playing yourself, you know, you're playing these, you know, these specific characters you're talking about, um, changes the outcome of the story. Is that accurate? Oh, hundred percent. It's like the, the hand of God guiding some humans or human like things who don't know better that they are being guided. I, you mentioned, uh, a couple episodes ago until dawn. Um, yeah. So there's a there's a decent amount of what I would call in lack of a better word it's like you're it's a movie. Like yeah. you're pretty much just watching a movie and you and you make decisions at certain points and that changes the story, right? So last night I played um I think it's called I think the actual series is called like the Dark Anthology. Um Oh, but Man of Medan? Ma- Little Man Hope? of Medan. Yeah, I haven't played Little Hope yet, so no spoilers, but I beat Man of Medan or Medan um mm-hmm. yesterday and I started over again because I only made it through with three survivors instead of all five. Um that's the kind of thing that is um Chef's Kiss, man. Like that's that's my type <laughs> of game. You really liked it then. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I like. I want. I'm in it for the story, um, and I want the characters to behave the way I imagine they would. Okay. But I don't want. I don't. I don't desire to see myself represented there. So, it, to you, doesn't matter if it's sci-fi or cyberpunk, or um, or if it's a western or horror or even like dystopian, like. It's the story that attracts you? Yeah, and it has to be a tight story as well. Um, once, so, so once you can wander off the rails, um, I get bored. You know, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. In Fallout 4, there's this mechanic that some people like, some people didn't, where you could build settlements. It was kind of Minecrafty in the loosest sense where you can, you know, you can uh, construct walls and put up turrets and stuff like that. And I admit that I ended up just becoming a settlement maker. <laughs> like, and I stopped with the story altogether, but because, <laughs> but because to, like, I, I didn't give a shit about this story. Um, and I was just trying to make, a, but what I was trying to make, I think is thematically the same where I was trying to make a nice community for my NPCs, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's kind of what I was, into but that's interesting though yeah there's it's funny because when you talk about like red dead redemption or even like if you like text you know dystopian future like cyberpunk Mm -hmm. there are definitely places that you are mentioning that are oh you have this pressing story or thing to do but you don't have to do it at all <laughs> and if in the story they and i think there's one in cyberpunk that i've heard from a friend 
that specifically is like, you have to do this by tomorrow night. Well, you can just go off and do whatever you want for a year and then come back and it's still tomorrow night, I guess, <laughs> or something like that. And to your point, like, you can just go off into the woods. And by the way, my life goal is to be a rum runner and to shoot bears and grow a beard. Yes. <laughs> like, just camp in the woods. But I mean, yeah, it's just like, I don't even have to do the main story, you know? So that's kind of, I think, a template, right? To where, like, you have this open... It's like when they say open world game, it seems so vague, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just like, oh, well, there's some story quests that you can do, but you don't ever have to do any of them ever. Um, Maybe if you want a piece of armor or a certain weapon or just to complete the story. But then it's like on the other side of the buffet is like, oh, you can do this, or you can search and unlock points, or you can just kind of explore. So the story is kind of de-emphasized in those games, right? Yeah. Well, what, on the flip side, what it means is that you're... Like, with Red Dead Redemption, could I just wander off and let it become the early 1900s and grow old and, and gradually the West diminishes as the railroads are built? That would be dope. That's the story. I mean, that's when a, an open world is an open world is because the world is alive. But the, discont- the, the discontinuity between the world is either living or it isn't based off your actions um, bugs me. And so I think with these kind of like heavily narrated games, your actions and the world are interwoven. Yeah. So if you... Pl- it's it's interesting because when you think about this living system, right, or a living game, and that if you are the chosen one, the uh, the Neo to the Matrix, or the you know the Aragon of the Lord of the Rings, or whatever you want to say, <laughs> um, one of the things you don't see in a lot of games is like what happens when you don't do anything. Mm. I, I see it in like you know, kind of very specifically in these railroad narrative games like Detroit being human or, you know, um, like you said, uh, uh, Until Dawn or Man of Medan, um, to where there are very specific things that happen if you don't do things within a certain time or don't make the right narrative choices or screw up, right? So there's it changes. The story, the yeah. living, organic world changes. Um, but outside of those games, you're right, it, no one does that shit at all, right? <laughs> Like, I think if you even think of two things that come to mind is like an MMORPG, right? So let's say you're playing Guild Wars, and in Guild Wars there is a main story that is your character, but then there's also open world. Um, And you can come back to the main story at any point, just like Cyberpunk, just like um, Mad Max, right? Or or whatever. Um, But those, nothing negatively happens if you lose or fail the quest and you just go to one specific place to load up or join up with people to do that thing, right? Um, But there is no, oh no, now we're in the dark timeline because you failed to do X or save the princess or or whatever. And so there's no kind of, you know... Uh, it's it's something that's very unique to this railroad narrative kind of game that you're describing um and uh that the living system goes on with or without you you know things change the difficulty in designing that must be pretty pretty substantial but but yeah i think it's the i maybe it's having the illusion what i what i need out of a game is an illusion of impact on the world and maybe through those narrative type adventures that you know the the gulf between my actions and what happens in the world are um is pretty uh pretty small yeah so i'm wondering you say that you you're like you try to make the choices or run the character or play the character in the context of the story as they would act um do you ever just be evil to see what happens or, you know, be, or, you know, whatever you want to, just to see how the story changes. And do you replay? Because I'm assuming there's a replay value to all of these games because of, you know, the way the story changes. To be honest, not really. Like I'm always, all of my characters, like 
Okay. Yeah, all of these characters express a uh, kind of an assertive, neutral, or assertive good <laughs> like version of themselves. Um, where, yeah, I I feel real pain when I make them do something evil, but it depends on how it's cast, right? Like if if you if the game teaches you that evil, the evil choice isn't like blatantly cartoonishly evil but it's actually again like influenced from prior prior actions taken it's within the realm of the character then yeah maybe mm-hmm. so in mass effect again not a spoiler really but there's this i forget if it's in the first or second game but um your shepherd becomes a bit of a celebrity for a variety of reasons and the like a reporter comes to ask you a question and mass effect introduces these um quick time actions during conversations during these cinematics where depending on how good or evil you are they use the term paragon or renegade um they appear to you and if you're just badass enough to be like on the renegade spectrum um there's this thing where the reporter is asking a probing question and you get a renegade quick time action that's just like i'm done with this conversation it's clearly the evil action, but that's what the phrase says. It's like, I'm done with this conversation. At, mm-hmm. By this point, Mass Effect has taught you that what you see in the subtitle in the preview of your choice is not what the character will say. Um, and it's not cartoonishly evil or cartoonishly bad. It's in character. Mm-hmm. So anyway, what happens is like when you click this, like I'm done with this conversation. I'm, 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 I'm opting out of this interview. We're done here. Your shepherd just... <laughs> just like sucker punches the reporter bam just knocks them out and then walks oh away gosh, and nice. and those are the things like it's under those circumstances where okay I'll be, I'll be a little bit more badass than not um because it feels real but obviously there are circumstances where you choose the evil action and they're like laughing underneath a flashlight <laughs> right evil and those mm-hmm. things are silly I, I i like an element of i think rea- reality i think to it um yeah, so there's, in some of the games that you're describing, and I, I definitely, Man of Madon, as well as I think the Call of Cthulhu game and some other... Oh, that's um, a good one. And then I think there's also Wolf Among Us. I don't know if you've ever played that I one. I have. Excellent. Yeah. And so essentially in that, it's all fairy tales living in the city and you are the big bad wolf and called BB or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but... If you were diligent about talking to people or pursuing leads or finding out what's going on, options become available that in conversation and unlock that you can sometimes see like crossed out or grayed out. Like you don't know what that option was and that cues you. You're like, oh, I could have, I missed something because I could have asked something here that I didn't, that I missed, you know? Those cues in game in games are traumatic. In the Telltale games, especially like The Walking Dead, you say something either hurtful or whatever, and it's like Lee will remember this, <laughs> and you're like, oh shit, <laughs> like I, yeah. like, I didn't intend for that at all. Or or in Wolf Among Us, yeah, it's just like, oh, here's an entire path you can't even go through. Um, yeah, so that sequel to The Wolf Among Us comes out this year, which they're is making rarely- it. Yeah, so it's they did a trailer last year <gasps> that says it's coming out in 2021 this no, year. Really? And so I played it for the very first time last year at, when that trailer dropped for two. Um, and then I was just like, uh, and my nephew kept telling me, he's like, you got to play it, you got to play it. It's its own thing. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, and I played it, and I was, um, I don't want to ruin like the ending or the story or anything like that, but I was a total asshole badass i mean so anything that you could do that's just like get out of my face or like i know i don't have to put up with that or like i'm bringing you to justice you know i just that's the way i went with it um and yeah the story really changes based on okay you're an asshole um and this is what the asshole story is you know that's funny oh my gosh i a i did not know that happened because Wolf Among Us is one of those cult classics that I don't think played very well, at least in the market, um, when it, it came out. It is definitely a cult classic. And and then when they 
I don't know if it was E3 used to be a thing in the United States, right? So the E3 Expo was like this, oh my god, they're releasing games and then years and years ago Nintendo just bounced out and was like, yeah, we'll yeah. we'll we'll just do our own thing at the same time. And then PlayStation started doing that. And then now I don't think E3 is not even a big thing anymore. But at that point our time, the time stamp is still like the big reveal of the summer for the next year. They revealed the trailer for Wolf Among Us 2. So yeah, you shouldn't watch it. And I don't know, I don't want to ruin anything, but um, about the Dark uh, Pictures anthology. That's what it but, is, yeah. Yeah, I love the second one, Little Hope. I downloaded um, it. I'm so excited. And it has, unlike the first one, Little Ho- um, Little Hope has the the friend mode. I don't know if you've seen that or know Man anything of, about it. Man of Medan has, I don't know if it's the same, but Man of Medan gives you choices. Um, I actually tweeted this the other day because I thought it was great labeling for a horror game. It was play alone or don't play alone. Um, and... So maybe some it's sort of both shared of the story. Yeah. Yeah. So my understanding of it, I didn't know it was for the first one, um, but I know it was for the second. But it makes sense that they did it for both. Is that basically you get a friend to download a free trial, um, and then basically your games sync up, and then they get control over a particular character, and so you then essentially play the movie together and i say movie it's yeah. not a derogatory way because it's a lot of watching you know what yeah. I mean? and all you're really doing is like making some conversation choices and then at points you're trying to hit buttons so you don't trip or fall <laughs> or like do something like what you're saying but then you don't you're giving up control of all the characters to your friends and so if they mess up or die or they're an asshole or they're great and you're an asshole i mean it changes wow you know, the outcome and yeah, it's, it's like kind cosplay of, yeah, it's kind of like um, it's called. I don't know if it's like call, they call they call it something. It's just like a either a th- theater mode or um, friend mode or something. A movie night mode. Movie I think night it's mode. Movie night. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so basically, because the game is like four to five hours at max, you know, um, it makes it doable, right? And then I cannot wait for you to play and beat. Um, little hope because uh, I want to get your th- <laughs> get your thoughts on it. We should do um, some spoiler cast there. Um, when I saw Little Hope, I was like, it looks very, you know, camp campground horror, like whatever. And I was like, this this re- this feels like Tim. <laughs> this is like a this is like Tim's alley. Yeah. So, but then when you beat the game, you get the trailer for the third game. <gasps> oh, I'm so excited! And um, and th- what's weird about it is, as I tweeted months ago when I beat Little Hope, um, the picture that I guess it's the storyteller guy that you keep keep going back to, or the curator, yeah, the curator, yeah. He just pulls a book off a shelf, and the first one there's like six or five books I can't remember, and each of them have like a a printed gold thing on the spine and the first one's a boat and then the second one is a doll which is you know little hope but there's like five or six specific ones you can find the image online and i yeah. like i said i tweeted it i froze the the playstation and took a screenshot it seems like there's going to be five or six of them and the third one comes out this year so that's exciting and i, bo- and I think the third one is called house of ashes so this team this is this is Until Dawn's team, isn't it? Yeah, the same people who made Until Dawn. Yeah. And then Until Dawn has a sequel, apparently, but it's only for VR. Like, I guess PlayStation VR. Oh, crazy. VR. Yeah. Yeah, The Walking Dead is definitely at the beginning of all of those. I mean, it looks like that was the one that came out way before the rest, but... You should play, you should play Life is Strange, man, if you haven't. Um... I think I have, actually. Um... What is it about? Uh, Life is Strange One, and um, and some spinoff games around it. You are Max Caulfield. Whatever. You're an artsy um, high school girl in uh, the Pacific Northwest, and lo and behold, you discover that you can wind back time a little bit. Um, mm. Stuff happens, and you navigate through your 
overly dramatic <laughs> like like school experience um, in the frame in the framing of like a larger main narrative that has a point um, and you can play through you know it's basically the same thing where you pick your actions and do whatever but if you don't like it you can rewind and change oh wow and change okay. your actions and what you see sometimes is that you you get into a point where you die you cho- you chose the wrong action um, but the instead of like reloading your checkpoint it's through this frame framing of rewinding time to the right point so it always feels like it doesn't feel like you died and now you have to restart over it feels like you died and now you have to navigate the situation again but that dying is part of your timeline um, yeah. oh, wow. and life is strange 2 is similar it's about a it's about a boy in the pacific northwest who has powers but in this case it's totally different characters um, and it, they're about um, it has more to do with uh, the immigrant story and uh, the prom- problematic <laughs> United States um, and it's re- they're, just, they're just really moving and the fact that they have powers or whatever mm-hmm. is ant- I don't know if you've ancillary. seen two things like I don't know if you saw, saw Medium um, it's a new game that just came out um, it's called Medium Um and it is, uh, it's something that you may like because it is um, using kind of psychometry, which is the the thought, the psychic ability to read objects' histories, or the history of objects that you're holding, right? Like a psychic's power. Yeah. And then a medium can kind of, is kind of not only unfolding their story and discovering some stuff, but then also exploring this place and piecing together a mystery. So it's very story driven. Wow. I think you might like it. Um, and I've this seen. Looks up uh, my alley. Yeah. Yeah, but I imagine a young Michael <laughs> is very much um, loved pick a path books or choose your own adventure. Yes. yes. Is that correct? A hundred percent. Yeah. So there's a. Um, uh, it sounds like that's kind of, you know, kind of up your alley. Uh, is this trans? If so, if you took this narrative, what you're describing in video games in many ways, or just like the text and picks up, pick a path and choose your own adventure books. Does this also extend to like tabletop games and board games? Are there board games that are story driven that you really like? And I thought in the past you were talking about maybe it's I don't know if it was a role playing game or a tabletop or a board game was it something with Dracula or Vlad or something like that? Oh yeah, um, oh, uh, Dracula's Fury. I forget the name of it. I'll tell you in a second. Um, it's a board game. Fury of Dracula. Yep. Uh, this is specifically a game where uh, you're kind of in like the the late Victorian period and you are playing the roles of like a Van Helsing and other vampire hunters who must chase Dracula around Western Europe. Um, And as you, um, what's Dracula doing? It's like, ah, you know, he's going from city to city, making vampires, you know, doing Dracula shit. Um, But your goal is to find him and you don't, it's not clear where he is. So you have to, it's, it's, it's very much a mystery detective type of game where, you have a ticking clock um you can fail and become infected yourself you can just run out of time uh and dracula wins you know like it's 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 one of those it's, it's of those a board games. game oh yeah it's hard to find though uh if i'm looking at it on like oh gosh i mean like you can buy it from amazon for like 150 bucks i don't i could say it's worth it um but it's one of those games that i have that I don't really have anyone to play with, <laughs> you know. But, but is is it story driven or very much, or is it? Um... It's not the same. It's not like a it's not like a tabletop RPG, right? I mean, you are constrained by the narrative that you are chasing Dracula for hashtag reason, and you have like a player card that explains some of your narrative uh, backstory. Um, but it's it's really it's really about chasing chasing the bloodsucker down and putting uh, driving a stake through his heart uh, if if you're good enough and it's designed in a way I think to suggest that you're not <laughs> you know um, 
but so I think you're um, so the stories that the games, no matter what format um, they're in, it sounds like largely railroad narratives or um, for video games, and then you know um, you jamming and uh, uh, tabletop role playing games are very the th- aspect you like is the character, the story, and that the world exists, you know, regardless of the characters um, mm. in action. And then hopefully their actions do um, intercede or change. But if not, it still goes on. Yeah, the world must be conducive to narrative. And your narrative must impact the world. And I think those two things together... Um, create a, a Michael drug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think we can end there. Thank you for listening to the design thinking games podcast to connect with your hosts, Michael or Tim, please go to designthinkinggames.com where you can request topics, ask questions, or see what else is going on until next time. Game on.